a reassuring letter came round UK universities some time ago now, it was April 2009, from the Chief Executive of the Arts and Humanities Research Council and former chair of the UK Research Council's consortium. It has, of course, already had its impact, but I want to remain with that anticipatory moment. The reassurance, picked out in bold, more or less boiled down to a reassuring sentence. I quote, I cannot emphasize sufficiently that excellent research without obvious or immediate impact will continue to be funded by the research councils and will not be disadvantaged within the assessment process. The rest of the letter was, of course, all about impact. <laughs> its tone, mild and cajoling. It is only reasonable for the UK government to expect the recipients of state funding to indicate the broader benefits of their research to the public at large. And I have, I have no comment on that. What might give one pause, however, is how information about the impact of completed projects is to be captured. Um, and in fact, this has already been brought into our conversation. I quote, the demonstrable contribution that excellent research makes to society and the economy is to be embodied in the questions that applicants for research grants have to answer when they're completing the impact summary that is being introduced into application forms for all research councils over 2009. <coughs> Of course, they don't mean that will be the only form of assessment, but the three questions, who will benefit from the research, how, and what will you do to ensure benefit, imply some sort of prognosis to be made long before work has started. But there's a little more reassurance in the letter. I deceived you. There wasn't only one sentence. There was something else as well. The reassurance was, this is not to take away from other aspects of the application, just to add value to it. It's an attempt to reduce the uncertainty of not knowing whether or not there'll be any impact, while of course inscri inscribing that uncertainty into the research proposal itself. Now there's an obvious problem, not necessarily a soluble one, with deploying research proposals to this end. The AHRC chair might have given some attention to genre, given the literary humanities background, the research proposal is a document of the imagination. It is not the investigation. The research proposal is ipto facto, written at the moment when there is a very proper uncertainty about the direction in which research would lead, um, and we have already had statements enough um, that it wouldn't be research otherwise. Indeed, many would say it was open to cultivate open-endedness. The rest comprises goals or aims. But at the same time, the research proposal is a request for money, and it's sensitive to the ethics of reciprocity and trade-offs. Yet there can be no certainty here either. So one finds no certainty about getting funding. Yeah? So one finds applicants invariably offering a simple substitute, a promise. The research proposal becomes a promissory note. It would not matter, perhaps if it were not circulating in a promissory economy where value is created in the prospect of things to come. That economy, culture if you prefer, positively encourages speculation. One consequence is that to be visible at all, people have to hype up their claims. The research councils themselves have obviously been making huge promises to the government. That reassuring letter put some of them into the past tense. The magnificent research funded by the research councils, you can hear what the promise was, <laughs> has had a huge impact on the well-being and economy of the UK. What lies in the future is, instead of taking it for granted, making the continuing, uh, the continuing potential of research explicit. What is interesting for us, perhaps, is the institutional embedding of speculation within the administration of the proposal. The issue is the way efforts to reduce risk introduce new uncertainties. A particular form of uncertainty is created by the promise. It is also created in the prospect of impact evaluation that ignores the temporal structures of particular disciplines, one that probably renders the special presentism of much sociology and anthropology disabling. 
whole disciplines may well come to be ranked and judged in terms of how they can deal with the future. That is not by the usefulness of outcome, but by what they can tell us about what is going to come next. In other words, what is at stake is their epistemological formation, whether or not they are structured to anticipate what an outcome might be. And it's being able to anticipate that constitutes a successful promise. Now, I wish I had some empirical work on research proposals to report to you, but I'm afraid I can't do that. Instead, I comment on the extent to which certain kinds of impacts are likely to register as impact, others less so. A discipline's temporal structure is one issue. Another is how a piece of research engages with others, especially when these others count as collaborators or users, and because of its prominence in UK Research Council's rhetoric, I shall start with this. Various strategies for registering impact exist. A common rubric under which added value is evident is knowledge transfer. Transfer makes explicit what is already implicit in the idea of turning academic output to use. For what government agencies and the like generally mean by use is deployment outside the immediate academic context, or at least outside the home discipline. Identifying external collaborators as a way of pointing to wider audiences. Collaborations with colleagues across ostensible disciplinary lines can thus appear as one step towards demonstrating external interests and thereby registering impact. Indeed, collaboration with non-academic organisations is the first of the suggestions in the Research Council letter for how humanities and social science researchers can show that their work does have impact while collaborative research across academic institutions is the first entry in the UK Research Council's website Knowledge Transfer Portal, as consulted in May 2010. The inference is that internal circulation, however defined, does not count. To qualify, knowledge transfer must demonstrate that what was generated in one context can be used um, in another, um, Lucy's uh, projectiles. Now, there is something special about the impact implied in collaboration. If not actually seen in advance, it can be signalled. A research proposal can claim to be fostering synergy. I don't just mean that the prospective research will, but that this possible outcome is brought forward into the proposal itself. Synergy is, self-referentially, taken to be generated through interaction and especially through collaboration and partnership. The anticipation that places a premium on the moment of combination summons a particular temporality. Perhaps the contemporary research proposal is indicative of a more general approach to knowledge making. Certainly tremendous emphasis is placed on its preparation these days. Clearly, preparation lends itself to a prospective rhetoric, for the proposers finding justifications for their plans and always has done. But a kind of managerial optimism often informs the exercise these days. Proposers may feel they have to describe aspects of the project with epithets, and these are real-life examples, such as path-breaking or pioneering, put a positive value on all aspects of method and protocol, and make every item appear to contribute an advantage, because this must be a product, obviously, that funders will buy. And the funders may well stipulate what they want, in the UK Research Council's endorsement of collaboration as a methodological goal. Indeed, the present policy direction in UK government-funded research takes as self-evident the inherent creativeness of synergy, a common good that's also a condition for innovation. So synergy isn't left to, fold, left to unfold unaided. Proof of its likely value has to be planned especially in the light of knowing just what a short time span is going to be involved in evaluating the impact of the project once the research has taken place. There will be a, an expectation that returns can be pointed to straight away, and I think that's because that is what collaboration appears to promise. For in the present rhetorical climate, it seems that institutional and funding expectations often focus on the prior moment of getting the mix of expertises together. The advantages and benefits of assembling people from diverse backgrounds rehearses 
an, out, an, an idea of outcome. After all, synergy is otherwise a rather odd virtue to plan for. It either does or does not happen. But there's a widely shared expectation that interaction as such is an achievement and will have spin-offs. I suspect this is indeed the optimism of a managerial approach to knowledge making. In short, the bringing together of different expertises or whatever form the partnership takes already has an effect. The collaborative proposal acts out what it promises. But at the same time, a promise can only be performed if one can point to an outcome that is going to exceed the accomplishments of the present. Synergy must also be there in a promissory form, as a kind, if you like, of speculative synergy. Now, the epithet speculative, I took from Kashik Sundarajan. His model of biotechnology and genomics is that they offer a strategic promissory horizon in which biocapital fuels a speculative form of capitalism. Value is created in the promise of things to come and in the market, literally, as promissory statements from firms against which investment is raised. Promissory market marketing generates, he says, value in the present to make a certain kind of future possible, for a vision of that future has to be sold, even if it will never be realised. It's as though the speculative marketplace were one huge research proposal. What matters is indeed how things are described and how elements are put into place to realise the promise. Hence, as we've seen in academia, the very securing of collaborators to work together on a project enacts the hope for future outcome. This is the temporality of combination, the moment of mixing that is designated as no more than a prelude to the research but looms large in its promissory value. It is here that Hiro Miyazaki's thesis about hope as a methodological problem for knowledge is germane. The problem is very, is very simply that the retrospective acknowledgement of hope in a description of people's expectations prevents or occludes conveying its prospect, prospective momentum. Hope, he writes, is thus a problem for the retrospective character of contemplative knowledge, which of course characterises social anthropology. The problem, I think, is as acute for disappointment. Hope can be deferred or reinvented. Disappointment, in being overtly retrospective, conceals the preemptive nature of any judgment that anticipated how expectations would not be fulfilled. The problem for knowledge would be how to know what effect such concealed anticipation might have had on the outcome. Empirical evidence suggests that collaborative projects are particularly prone to being regarded as only patchily successful, and that indeed in some cases it may appear that negative evaluations had been in play from the outset. People can embark on a collaborative enterprise sceptical about the likely impact of some of their fellow contributors. If so, how would one know that a negative evaluation had been made? Masaki and Riles talk of endpoint as the moment at which a project becomes apprehended retrospectively and epoch closed. Failure of knowledge in the cases from financial markets that they consider can be openly acknowledged. Yet researchers and their managers are hardly in a position to declare at the outset that they are more, that they are more confident about some parts of an enterprise than others. Yet during the course of a project, an, an identifiable shortfall may be turned into a public measure, becoming a mark of internal criticism of some to the enhancement of the rest of a project. That is, disappointment in some areas can work to reinforce hope in others. And if you think there's an ethnography behind all this, there is. But it'll remain anonymous. In a situation bringing together researchers from different disciplinary backgrounds, some could be thought to be a priori more useful than others. Or if brought in, then over the course of the research become gradually marginalised or themselves become prey to doubts about what they thought they had to offer since their offering seems to have been dismissed in advance. Indeed, these researchers might think it was only for rhetorical reasons for the promise of the project that they were there at all. But how would one know? Looking to impact invites a prospect of disappointment as well as hope. 
The point is not, of course, that a promise cannot be kept, but rather that having to make a promise introduces an uncertainty about keeping it. Can disappointment be anticipated? Among the disciplines, anthropology and sociology receive, I suspect, more than their fair share of disappointed reactions from others. I refer to situations where, concealed from the proposal, advance, eval advance evaluation seemingly comes to being already written into research programmes. Dogging the usefulness of these areas of social science is an old problem that may be voiced by practitioners of other disciplines who, rather like government funders, often assume that studies of social conditions in the present must yield information that can be ext extrapolated into the future. Given this expectation, disappointment seems built in to the often already sceptical curiosity as to what non-predictive descriptions might have to offer the real world. For social research is often a reluctant predictor of future trends. Its strength is precisely that of retrospective reflection. It illuminates after the fact. Indeed, an anthropologist or sociologist might argue rather strongly that it is not, so to speak, futuristic knowledge that will help us in the future, but knowledge that does not look future-oriented at all, namely the ability and skill to inform oneself about the present. Now, not all social scientists would agree. Uh, British Summick, Bridget Summick, for example, uses the phrase speculative knowledge to give social scientists some encouragement. Uh, the phrase for her evokes an engaged, opportunistic and political means through which researchers in social science building, I quote, scenarios of possibility can have greater impact than they do at the moment on policy information. And she goes on, speculative knowledge creates best guesses for possible futures on the basis of research into current social practices. The aspiration possibly finds a realisation in Dumit's, that's um, Joseph Dumit, depiction of, um, of marketable venture science that overdetermines research in the natural sciences in the US, promissory, risk-laden, and steeped in the ideology of innovation. The ways in which the future can be brought into the present have long been a source of optimism as well as apprehension. Expectations for technological development in general create prospective structures that sometimes appear to lack nothing but activation. Protensions, as Bourne identifies them in commercial fields, that is, projections or anticipations, make that future knowingly lived in the present. A closeness not necessarily achieved by prediction as such, for prediction can construe alien worlds from which the present for the moment saves us. With a proposition to act on them, with speakers on their behalf, pretensions become promises. Social science can be speculative under the general future orientation of research practice. Practitioners see a distinct asset in imagining what might turn out to be important or interesting. However, a methodological orientation to knowledge of the present can also appear rhetorically at odds with the continuous speculation that seeks to realise value now in the making of future visions. Synergy in collaborative practices has been my example. The future is made present the moment collaboration is secured in the promise or hope or anxiety or disappointment that accompanies concern with what interactions are going to generate. Sociologists and anthropologists are all too aware that in studying society, they may also be cast as spokesmen for it, somehow representing its interests, so that bringing in social science implies taking society into account. Social scientists in general may also be cast into the role of evaluators, the evocation of society holding promise of an internal audit. At the same time, the social scientist may be regarded as lumbered with or impeded by his or her discipline in academic terms so that the discipline finds itself on, on the line. Evaluation, becomes, is, evaluation is only recognised as iterative feedback meant to contribute unmediated to ongoing managerial practice and disappoints when it does not. I've been suggesting that such prejudging takes on a special edge in the present climate that encourages a constant orientation to future horizons. And having reached my own horizon, 
With a few minutes to spare, I can now slow down. <laughs> Suppose we put this in a larger context. We should be scrutinising both projects where hope lies ahead and those where its value or the value of some components is questioned, at that point pro probably covertly, from the outset. For understanding the outcomes of knowledge practices, these enactments should be seen in tandem. Hope and disappointment are two sides of the same promissory coin. Thus change management, as one might imagine drove the Research Council's emphasis on the restated need to demonstrate the impact of research to government funders, appears with all the future hype of an academic research proposal. Everything must succeed. And one could as well say that the academic research proposal, not of course the research, appears in turn with all the future hype of change management. Now of course, and obviously, there have been such proposals since research grants began, not to speak of all kinds of attempts to try things out. Yet the early granters of industrial patents knew what they were doing when they licensed not the idea for an invention, but the idea already embodied in a working artefact, an invention accomplished. Promissory capital and speculation on it do not require anything to have been accomplished. In like manner, research proposals have to show enough preliminary substance for the peer reviewer or funder to trust the promise, but the evidence of promise there must also be. Show's promise can no longer be the innocent comment that teachers and supervisors and research grant evaluators were once want to make on the work of junior colleagues. Let me return finally to where academics were once want to put the promise of the research proposal, the premise of doubt that underlay the imperative to find out the taken for granted unpredictability of outcomes, the, the curiosity, if you like. We should be concerned if it becomes debased. Now, I'm not going to go over grounds that Helga and Helga and her colleagues have already covered so well, um, but pick up a latter-day rendition of it, um, already mentioned by, by Lucy, in fact, uh, from the work of Callon. In praise of controversy, Callon and, uh, uh, co and, and uh, co-authors have called for the proliferation of debate. They are thinking of the rise in the last two decades of countless interest groups, consumer networks, publics of all kinds, in discussion over technological innovations such as mobile telephones or media medical technical crises such as BSE, and would like to see more, co controversy that is, for it embroils actors in quite unpredictable hybrids of interests and concerns. And that the unpredictability, um, I repeat again, uh, is important. The authors welcome the apparently haphazard, sometimes random, always heterogeneous interests that populate public concerns, including protests by interested parties agitated by developments proposed for their own backyards. I quote, the aim is the survival of that improbable but irreplaceable being, the ordinary citizen layperson. The controversies to which such interests lead often turn out to be in the course of better science. For controversies overflow pre-existing channels of inquiry. They link up problems in what the authors call the real world. In a time of uncertainty, it is through creating constant overflows of issues and actors that controversy breaks open the close embrace between scientist and policymaker and challenges the position of the scientist as provider of expertise. Governance is also at stake, controversies enrich democracy, so too is common sense. When agents in market transactions ignore how their actions impinge on other agents, the overflow from their actions constitutes an externality to which they are blind and which may well be to their cost. An example of the market's blindness to the interests of consumers was the BSE crisis in the UK. And I quote, why should enterprises producing animal feed be concerned about the distant and uncertain consequences for the consumer, for the consumer of beef, of recalcitrant prions, 
that will turn out to be sufficiently supple to cross the species barrier. No one can know everything, they argue, but we can at least be alert to issues that overflow the expertise, and I would call that knowledge management, meant to contain them. We're not talking here about collaboration in the Research Council sense, but about the proliferation and divergence of knowledge. Synergy may or may not be an outcome. In any event, sometimes the contexts of knowledge production are best held distinct. Isabel Stengers writes in praise of divergence to point out that there is no learning if there is no possible backlash if what you address is not able to display its own divergence. And by own divergence, she means not divergent from and thus in relation to another, but a trajectory defined on its own terms. She excoriates, I quote, the multifaceted machine called technoscience in the process of redefining our own worlds in terms that make them available for its comparative operation. Proponents of technological innovation, in effect, convert an academically pursued science based on doubt into the readily useful form called scientific objectivity. Such proponents are, in effect, acting as knowledge managers. So these writers see diversity under attack from the same source, the knowledge economy. Stengers has the darker tale to tell, namely of the death of science by knowledge management, where habits of criticism and counter-proposition are submerged in the course of technical solutions. Challenged in a presentation to reflect on a transformed future for the relationship between industry and science, she said, science would die. I'm a Darwinist. Species don't transform, they die. What would die was what allowed scientific practices to diverge along their own lines of flight. Indeed, both Callan and Stengers see controversy and scientific debate producing disparities that mean comparison between views can never be, in Stengers' words, unilateral. And she quotes the essayist Peggy to the effect that no comparison would be legitimate if the parties to be compared are not able to display their own version of what the comparison is about. In other words, in academic endeavour, no one party should be in charge of the grounds of comparison, nor is there any vantage point on the outside. While a plurality can always be aggregated into a single universe, even if it's no more than a universe of multiple points of view, hybrid forms in Cullen's vocabulary resist aggregation. The deviousness of appeals to impact lies precisely in attempts to specify outcomes. What is brought forward as potential impact may well conceal the need to find out or to hold in doubt a question over the range of things to be taken into account. Callan wrote that there is likely to be a cost in agents ignoring how their actions impinge on others. In a democracy, one might say, People have to, have to impinge upon one another, but that is an inquiry that needs opening up, not narrowing down. That precisely needs research and not management. Thank you. <laughs>